<laughs> Today we're going to be looking at another one of Electro Boom's videos. Specifically making a heated seat and he's just exposed like that. Okay, wouldn't recommend putting this in a nuclear plant's control room. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's say this. Hi, I have a great and unique idea, oh, which I is bet. turning your wooden or plastic seat into a heated seat so your fragile buttocks can rest in peace. All we need is a heating element, which I'll extract from this broken hair dryer as these wires. <laughs> oh, we're off to a lovely start here. So what is that nichrome wire? That's nickel and chromium. Most of them are anyway. Here we are. I hot glued these wires to my seat with their end connected to a cable where I can just plug into the wall. <laughs> okay, there we are. Just going to sit on top of it. It's not covered. There's no insulation. So you're just going to be exposed directly to the heat. I mean, how this works is pretty straightforward. Heat emission as a function of power, which power equals current squared times resistance or current times voltage. I know nichrome wire has relatively high resistance, which makes sense in wanting to um, optimize your power output or your heat emission. Though, I don't know about sitting directly on top of it, man. Where the f*** is it? Ooh, sparking too. And it sticks too, yeah, because it's getting hot. It's just going right into the shorts. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> I believe there's a few engineering steps like electrical insulation, temperature control, and ensuring the seat material, which I guess there was no seat material in this case, is flame retardant. Or maybe just you can only sit on that if you have well insulated and flame retardant shorts. All right. <laughs> the whole seat is oh, dude, it's on fire. <laughs> In hindsight, mounting a heating element with hot glue is a pretty dumb idea because the glue can melt and stick somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I didn't realize. Okay, so it still had hot glue on the top that he was sitting on. I thought he was just, it was just sticking right to the chair, but it hadn't even dried yet. <laughs> and also evidently sitting on super hot live wires is a terrible <laughs> terrible idea For a as my butt can confirm where are you but we shall not be discouraged there are other heating <laughs> elements i like that tradition now is he saying but we shall not be discouraged is he meaning that as a conjunctive or is he talking to his own butt that it shouldn't be discouraged all right use like the electric oven heating element that we can <laughs> unplug take easily off. The good thing about these is that the live wires are hidden inside the element, so you won't get shocked if you touch them. Okay, so you have electrical insulation, but what about thermal insulation? Or maybe just deal with it at a lower setting, and maybe not sit directly on top of it. So in North America, they run on over 200 volt AC. So if I run it on 120 volt, I should avoid superheating it. So connecting it to power, you won't get a shock, although it's drawing around 6 amps. Now, I don't know what metal it's made of. I'm guessing iron. But it's hardly conductive, so it's safe to touch. <laughs> Ow! F of course, it's getting hot. shocked is not the only concern. I was going to say, the main hazard with that is just the heat rather than the electric hazard. Just why you need both. I know he knows what he's doing, and I like the way he's demonstrating each individual safety concern differently. That's good, and it really speaks to what he knows. Obviously, this thing is a heating element and can get very hot even if I run it on 120 volt AC. And it's- Yeah, even lower voltages can make this thing hot. Pretty uncomfortable to sit on anyway, so I went and bought some other heating elements. This one is pretty small. Maybe I like that he's going for stuff you just sit, you just put your butt on directly. That's okay. Use it to heat a baby, or as intended, electric charcoal starter. What? Don't use it on babies, you idiots. I mainly think of that infamous scene in Home Alone where he heats up the doorknob. This one is pretty nice and fits my seat well and is made for 240 volt 3000 watts. Shaped like it. Which is very similar to my oven element. I will. It has that kind of seat toilet 
that toilet seat type shape, so that one probably the closest of what he's shown thus far. Running it on 120 volt AC, which means four times less power or 750 watts. It can still burn, so I'm planning to reduce the power to it using a light dimmer. It says this dimmer is compatible with incandescent lights as well as new dimmable lights, which makes me wonder what is the difference between this new dimmer and old ones. We have one of these old dimmers. <laughs> Why? We have this old dimmer which I'll try to probe using my 4 channel awesome new Keysight scope <laughs> Which I'll also give away 5 of them at the end of the video One to a school and the rest between my patrons and viewers If you like to win these as well as tons of other possible tools from Keysight Wave 2019 Register from the link in the video description oh, More about it at the end And so, but entertaining. if I short these two contacts, the light turns on now if I try to probe this, connecting the program without shocking myself. Oh, actually, they share the same ground. I don't need to connect the ground. Okay, now the yellow line is the input voltage and the red is the output. And if I turn it on, you see that when I slide the dimmer, a portion of the output is cut off. Oh, yeah. It's here at minimum and here at maximum. And so this reduces the effective AC voltage output over a resistive load. But things like... Which makes sense for turning down the lights. Lights are not necessarily like a resistive load. Although my LED light seems dimmable and is working fine with this dimmer. It flickers a little bit at low voltage. The old dimmer I tested is made of a solid state or silicon switch, like a transistor, that is a type of SCR or thyristor. And in this case, it's a triac, which is a bidirectional switch. Oh. Yeah. Too many words? Basically, <laughs> it's an open circuit between the two main terminals until you send a current into the gate terminal. And then it switches closed and stays on as long as you run current through it. Even after you remove the gate signal. And then it only turns off when you stop running current through it. It is bidirectional, meaning that the current can run through it both ways and has to be triggered accordingly. So this is the AC input. So what's interesting is triacs aren't really used in nuclear power plants that much, at least not for their critical safety systems. Now they're used in some of the non-critical systems, like in the secondary, the non-nuclear part of the plant, the part where like the steam, such as the turbine building, like water treatment systems, chem secondary chemistry control, so they don't control the chemistry within the reactor coolant system, things within say the condensate and feed water systems that really just feed the steam generators and the main turbine and can be completely divorced from the nuclear part of the plant, where you can vary the amount of speed of pumps, like varying the amount of chemicals you want to add into a system, things of that nature, and also for support stuff like HVAC systems in a non-critical area, the ones that are more designed for personal comfort rather than protecting sensitive electronics. And the reason for that, they often fail in a shorted state, so a conducting state, so there's no guarantee that power will stop when you need it to. Like, you don't want a shorted triac to prevent the control rods for dropping in a reactor in a reactor protection system. Those, of course, fail safe as in they fail with all the control rods falling in in less than a couple of seconds when it senses the condition that the reactor needs to be shut down. So you don't want those things there. We have a resistive load like an incandescent light. And let's say these are the trigger pulses to the input of the triac. The output voltage is zero until the edge of the trigger and then the switch closes and the output follows the input until the voltage reaches zero, which means that the current through the resistor is zero. And it turns off and again turns on by the next edge of oh, the cool. trigger and follows the input again and cycle continues like we saw in the scope. Now by moving the dimmer knob, we are simply moving the location of these trigger pulses that changes the on time of the triac and controls the output power. So for example, if this pulse happens earlier, more of the voltage cycle goes out. Driving the inductive and capacitive loads is a whole other mess because their current is 90 degrees phase shifted and turns zero when the voltage is at peak. Okay, let's see what the new dimmer does differently. 
That is one drawback about not having triax in certain things. It's a lot of systems are kind of on or off, which is good what you need for strictly. It's by far the safest, but sometimes if you want some fine control, the ability to make this slight adjustment is often missed. Does the exact same sh <laughs> So what? It's compatible with the LED lights because the new LED lights are designed to be dimmable and this takes the credit? What the hell? <laughs> Don't kick live circuits because they can kick back. Anyway, let's see what's the difference between dimmable- <laughs> Yes, they kick back because they're very threatened by you. Dimmable LED lights. I'm gonna film different lights using my camera at slow motion to see what difference we see. Here's the incandescent. As expected, the brightness changes by the AC cycle. Here's the dimmable LED. It behaves like the incandescent. Okay. And here's the undimmable light. And its output light is constant. So the dimmable LED light is designed to be dependent on the AC voltage amplitude. That's why we can dim it with the change of AC voltage. But the undimmable LED behaves badly on a dimmer because it's designed to have mostly a constant brightness yeah. output <laughs> independent to the AC voltage. It flickers. So, for the most part, you see it has a constant brightness, but at very low AC voltages, it, it craps out. Both have their own benefits. One provides dimmability, while the other one provides a fixed output brightness independent to the input fluctuations. Which is another good analogy why you want the fixed, predictable outcome for safety-related systems. This is a good little comparison. I like this. We are getting distracted. Let me hook up the dimmer to my heater and I'll measure the voltage and temperature of the heater. Here we have voltage and temperature and if we turn it on at minimal, it's only around 4 volts and it heats up very slowly. But we can ramp it up so it heats faster yeah. and then ramp it back down again. There you go. Very nice. Now we have an industrial seat warmer for your thick buns. Ooh, the dimmer box <laughs> says it can't handle more than 600 watts, but we might be running 750 watts max. Oh well, I have a solution for that. There, I hot glued two pieces of, of stick to limit how far you can turn the knob. Genius. We don't need more than it. half anyway. <laughs> There, now all you need is to shove this thing in a It's a simple solution. Not to mention one with something that doesn't conduct electricity. ...in for comfort and sit on it. <laughs> on the other hand, if somebody accidentally breaks these sticks and set it to maximum, it could overheat the heater or the dimmer and set the house on fire. We could design a very good system where a microcontroller monitors the heating element's sure. temperature and PWMs the output power Kind of like a thermostat Control the temperature to exactly what you adjust using a sophisticated and fail-safe control algorithm Yeah, I mean that's one level of things to make it safe Have your control algorithm and also if your control algorithm happens to fail have it fail-safe as in turning the heater off Good principle Now I'm waiting for the part where he says but we're not going to use that I think I am destined at smarter every day <laughs> All I need is one of these food temperature sensors and oh. tie it to my heating element. Oh, See what man, I am not a fan of those. <laughs> I've gone through so many. Uh, I don't even know what the accuracy rating on those things are, but they always seem like it's off. It says 190 degrees when it's still... Like on a steak, it'll say 190 degrees when the cow is still mooing, practically. Done is that I cut the housing and removed the glass, and I also glued a piece of wire here to the housing that can move now. And normally this needle could move freely when the temperature rises, but now as the temperature rises the needle gets stuck to this piece of wire. Okay. So the temperature can't rise anymore because the needle is stuck. Is that, is that how it works? Because I mean the needle is stuck but the temperature could be rising, it's just not showing it. Hmm. I think we need to do better. Here I did one more thing. <laughs> I added a piece of wire here connected to the shaft of this thing that's also shorted to the housing. So now when the temperature rises, the gauge shorts the housing to this piece of wire here and acts like a thermal switch. Here's the plan. I have a normally closed relay that drives the heater element and its coil is driven by my thermal switch and is supplied through a diode resistor and capacitor. I also keep the dimmer so I can adjust the rate of temperature rise. Now what- Can't say I've ever seen anything like that used as a thermal switch, but okay. <laughs> I mean, thermal switches come up a lot in nuclear power. Like, there are certain valves for, like, say, the residual heat removal system 
that simply will not operate unless your reactor coolant is below a certain temperature because that residual heat removal system is only designed to remove heat during refueling outages. But can you imagine, oh man, putting a little meat thermometer, now that meat thermometer would have to go up beyond 350 degrees Fahrenheit, so that would be a pretty well done steak right there, but <laughs> I couldn't imagine using something like that for that kind of system. This is that when I plug in the AC, the heater element is on and heats up, as well as my thermal switch that's connected to it. When the temperature reaches the threshold that I set with my thermal switch, the switch closes and energizes the coil of the relay, sure. and the relay switches over is... and turns off the heater element. Yep. Now the heater cools down, and when it cools down below the threshold, the switch opens and de-energizes the coil, and the relay switches back over, and the heater turns on, heating back up again. So the temperature is controlled around my set temperature. Change of plan. I'm gonna use a 12... What's the margin of error on your thermometer? <laughs> ...wall adapter to drive my coil, because with the relay I have, that resistor okay, would volts. turn into a light bulb. And we plug it in. There we go. Now the heater is on and you will see that the gauge will start rising. There we go. The switch is closed and the heater is off. Of course, there is a delay for the temperature to get through to the thermometer. And mm -hmm. so the temperature overshoots a bit and drops down afterwards. At which point the thermometer switch should open again. There, the heater is back on and the needle moves back up again. Great! Now I can shove all these into a cushion. It's also weird seeing a temperature switch that you can effectively just turn the needle by hand and have it do what you want. Needless to say, they don't let you do that in nuclear power. There, now we just plug it in. Uh. <laughs> oh, they sell seat warmers for cheap. Was this a good video? Did you learn something? There, now we just plug it in. Uh. Oh, they sell seat warmers for cheap. Yeah. Was this a good video? Did you learn something? Oh, I did. Then I sure did. That was, that was a great exercise as far as what not to do while at the same time teaching you electrical, thermodynamic, and control system principles. I've said this before, but I would have liked having him as a professor in my electrical and electronics engineering classes. Thanks again for the recommendation, and thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.